Tonight's event is presented in collaboration with the School of Journalism and in the context of the contemporary Korean exhibit, Wonders and Witness, here at CCP. Regarding the screening, this film, it's an award-winning documentary. The captivating story unfolds between Tucson and Seoul, featuring uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Kim Newton and former freelance photographers here tonight. So, and the documentary was produced by the Korean director, Kim Manjin. Kim's distinctive directing styles is highly regarded within the Korean documentary professional community. His ability to deeply connect with the main characters, the sophisticated use of music, and his profound interest in South Korea's modern history and society have had a lasting impact on young South Korean documentary filmmakers. Please, after the film, stay and join us for a conversation and Q&A session with uh, Professor Kim Newton and Dr. Ji Hee Kim, UFA photo history professor. So without further ado, I'm gonna play this for you. I'm gonna turn off the lights and I hope you enjoy and get inspired. So as promised, we would like to invite you to stay for a conversation and Q&A section. And I want to formally introduce you to Professor Newton and Dr. Lee Hei Kim. So if you have met already Professor Newton, he has over 30 years of experience in photojournalism, beginning as a freelance photojournalist based in Tokyo, Japan, and Seoul, South Korea, serving Asian news, business, and feature stories for the New York Times, Forbes, Business Week, People, Time, U.S. News and World Report, and Le Figaro, to name a few. Notable assignments include documentation of China's Muslim Uyghur minority in the remote western province of Xinjiang, political and social unrest leading up to and including South Korea's fair free elections, culminating in Seoul's hosting of the 1988 Olympics, ceremonies and cultural reactions surrounding the death of Japan's Emperor Hirohito. From Asia, he joined Reuters New Pictures in London as picture editor for Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. Newton then joined the Knight Rider Tribute News Service in Washington, D.C. as senior photo editor for international news, while at Knight Rider, Newton oversaw the September 11th terrorist attacks, wars of Afghanistan, Iraq, and Kosovo, conflicts in the Middle East, Indonesia, and Russia. Please help me welcome Professor Newton here. Joining him in the conversation, um, please help me welcome also Dr. Dihei Kim. She is an assistant professor in the Art History program at the School of Art, University of Arizona. She earned a PhD in Art History at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. She has been publishing on Korea photography, including her first book, Photography and Korea. She has been writing on vernacular photographic practices and on documentary films and visual culture in relation to the Cold War and gender politics in East Asia. At the University of Arizona, she launched a series of symposia on Asian photography with the Center for Creative Photography in the spring of 2022 and fall of 2023 too. And she's currently working on her second book project on funerary use of portrait photography in East Asia. Please help me welcome Dr. Ji Hei Kim. Thank you for joining us tonight. Can you hear me? Yep. So, um, I mean, for me as a photo historian, the, the very photograph, this photograph featured uh, on the magazine and also in this uh, documentary film really stood out because this is basically photograph within photograph. So like we have photograph of that moment, but at the same time, 
one of the uh, college students is holding another photograph of uh, Yi Han Yeol, uh, the, the Yonsei University college student who died uh, at the street demonstration. So especially the portrait photograph of Yi Han Yeol was exactly my dissertation topic, which is funerary portrait photography, like the black ribbon uh, surrounding the frame of portrait photography demarcates its a specific use for funeral and memorial services. So it demarcates the sitter and the subject within the image is that. So uh, it has various unique function and role in not exclusively in Korean society, but in general in East Asian society. So throughout this film, we were able to see a lot of these funerary portrait photographs of uh, the college students uh, who lost their lives uh, in the 1980s on, on street, uh, during street demonstration. But at the same time, this specific funerary portrait photograph also uh, 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 allows or uh, asks uh, the viewer or the living people to recognize their physical body is gone, but their soul and their spirit still remains. That's why we do have annual memorial service to commemorate uh, the dead, uh, not exclusively for those uh, victims, but in general for any family members throughout, uh, throughout Korea and also throughout East Asia. And especially around this time during the 1980s, a lot of uh, funerary portrait photographs were on street uh, with the college, college students to protest against uh, the military regimes and uh, the dictators, uh, including uh, Chun Doohan and also the previous dictator, Jung Hee, as well. And it was like almost like history repeats twice <laughs> in 2017. Uh, the President Park geun who was impeached, was the daughter of the, the, the first military dictator, Park Jong-hee, and the, who ruled the country in the 60s and the 70s. And recently, uh, there was uh, another uh, film uh, was released about this, this history, uh, which was, was about uh, Chun Doo-hwan, the military dictator. The film title is Spring of a Soul about the coup d'etat uh, he initiated uh, um, uh, to take a power as the president or the successor to the previous military dictator in, uh, in the winter of 1979. And then it was also quite uh, ironic that Yi han uh, was from Gwangju, the very city where Chun Doohan uh, really uh, basically massacred uh, civilians uh, in 1980s, in the May of 1980. And, um, and, and, I, and I knew you were in Japan for many, many years as a journalist. And I like, it might be uh, help, helpful for us to know like what motivated you to visit Korea and how much you knew about this political like situation uh, in Korea from when you were in Japan? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, when, I, when I first um, thought about going to um, South Korea, you have to understand what was going on in the 80s uh, in that region. There were, in the 1980s, there were three democracy movements that, occ that occurred. The people power movement in the Philippines was the earlier one then the democracy movement in South Korea. And those two were successful movements. The third one um, was not, and that was Tiananmen Square in China in 1989. And uh, when I first went to South Korea, I actually went at the invitation of the Korean National Tourist Board in 1986. And they um, just wanted scenic tourist pictures. And I really hadn't been following what was going on in, in, um, in the democracy movement at that time. But when I got to South Korea, I saw that this was not a place where 
um, tourists were going to be coming on a regular basis at the time. And I they sent me this Sheju or yeah, Shejudo Shejudo Island um, to photograph the new Hyatt Regency Hotel. And so I did all that and I I spent that time there. But when I got back to Seoul, I, I saw what was happening and I went back to Japan, um, applied for a journalism visa and went right back to um, South Korea and spent the next three years um, photographing what you've seen a lot of today. So basically, like, I mean, there had been a lot of college student protests throughout the country, not exclusively in Seoul, but in other cities uh, around this period. So it was not well acknowledged when you were in Japan, right? It was not covered very much in the in Japanese media. At there, all. there wasn't a lot of coverage. And, and for me, I didn't speak uh, or read Japanese. So I was reading um, Western papers and um, the Herald Tribune and so forth. And there was very little being written about South Korea. Mm. Um, but what was happening, what was coming to South Korea were the Olympic Games in 1988. And with the Olympic community that comes, the journalists from all over the world come too. So um, I, I think that really propelled global interest in what was happening in South Korea. Uh, and as GA said, you know, for decades, South Koreans have been protesting for democracy for a long time through many dictators. Um, but I think the by the time of 1987, I think a lot of things came together and one of them, one element was the Olympic Games that came to South Korea at that time. Yeah, because uh, basically like um, like the 60s and 70s and all the way uh, like the early and mid 1980s, like under the this military authoritarian regimes of Park Jong-hee and also Chun Doo-hwan. But at the same time, these military regimes was also endorsed by the U.S. government. So like the U.S. intervention and also tension like in, in the region, like between between North Korea and South Korea. So the, we have we still have really strong presence of U US military uh, power uh, within uh, in the peninsula. And also Chun Doo-hwan's regime was also endorsed. I mean, he, 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 he took power due to the coup d'etat he, he began in the late, uh, in the winter of 1979, but it was basically endorsed by the, the US uh, government as well. So. And this was a question that we had um, in 1987 and 1988, 1987, was how was the U.S. government going to react here? Um, were they were they going, because Chen Duan at the time, there was talk that he was going to suppress this movement because the Olympics were coming. So that meant a massive slaughter to the student population to the population that was demonstrating. So these were questions we had at the time. And and um, and in the end, I think the US uh, put pressure on Chen Duan to, to step down and, and did. I think the irony, however, is that they got their democracy movement, but the person who was gonna be the next dictator, No Te Wu, won that first election. Um, and that was, that was due to a division uh, in the opposition parties that that caused the vote to go to um, No Te Wu. No um, he eventually went to jail too. So, so like like the situation, like the the situation in the nineteen eighties and also in the seventies, really really similar, like the U.S. intervention in uh, in Latin America. Uh, and its politics and like Susan Meisler's photographs of a lot of uh, protests of for democracy in all the, like El Salvador and other parts of Latin America. And she really tried hard to reveal the the US intervention into all those uh, uh, state violence uh, at the time. So 
So as a photojournalist uh, from the United States, I, I was wondering like how you view the situation like from this this perspective as well, and then how like basically you you contributed your photographs to the the journals and magazines and how those editors responded and also interpreted uh, this uh, event or what was going on in South Korea from their perspective as well. Yeah. Well, I think, I think um, there, there was a lot of, there wasn't a great deal of interest in what was going on in South Korea, but back here in, in, the, in the States, what you were seeing on television were those police in those Darth Vader helmets with their tear gas guns firing, and you saw this marching and and um, and this sort of back and forth between the students and the demonstrations, and the and the press in the U.S. was heavily present in in South Korea at the time. But what I found really interesting um, was that in the Mornings, I would get on a plane and I would fly to um, Pusan or an, another industrial city to photograph for Forbes or Business Week what was going on economically in South Korea, which was Hyundai and Samsung and all these companies that were on the rise. And I would do that in the morning and in the afternoon I would fly back because students don't like to get up and demonstrate in the morning. <laughs> and so by the afternoon, uh, the demonstrations would occur. So it was a very surreal kind of, kind of thing going on. Um, uh, and and I, don't, I don't know that we were really following the US, react, the US reaction. We were, we were just following what was going on on the, on the ground. I also wonder um, if you have any chance to um, to interact with um, the U.S. Uh, GIs, or because is even even within Seoul, very close to Yonsei University, like in Itaewon, like we do have U.S. military bases and also camp towns catering to the presence of U.S. GIs. Yeah, I think there's thirty thousand troops still in South Korea. Um, and the DMZ from Seoul is 26 miles away. And we would often go on press junkets up, up to the DMZ. Whenever the North and the South would meet, they would often meet at the DMZ. And there are these Quonset huts up there. And um, they're right on the demarcation line. And, and the, the table that goes, it right, runs right down the demarcation line. So on the on one side of the table is the south, and the other side is the north. And we would often go up um, to Camp Casey, which is the military base right on the border. Um, and, and we would go to these um, meetings of the north and the, and the south, and, and we would photograph. Um, but it really gives you a sense of how, how close they are to, to Seoul. You know, in, in, during the Korean War, I think the North Koreans went from the demarcation, what, what is today the demarcation zone, the DMZ, all the way down to Pusan in less than a week. So, uh, you know, it's, it's always, it's really interesting. I was just, my wife and I were just in Korea in October, and, um, and we passed by the base in, in downtown. We didn't, back in, the, back in the 80s, we saw a lot more, um, soldiers on the streets and in the cl in the clubs and in the restaurants and uh, in Itaewon and and places like that. Um, we didn't notice that this time at all, really. But what we did notice was we were with the director and we're driving in the car, and we see these military police on the side of the road um, doing an exercise. And um, my wife my wife pointed out. Know, what's going on here? And he said, "Oh, we just ignore that," and, and kept on going. But the real, but the reality is, is, you know, and right now, if you're reading the news, you know, North Korea is raising its sabers again, and 
um, there's a lot of attention being paid by the US military as to what what moves they're 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 making. So this has always been the case. Um, but I think now it's you know what they're what they're saber rattling over um, is something to keep a close eye on and watch out. And it's also quite fascinating to see that you encounter in 2017, like on the street, like a group of um, Korean people waving the US flag uh, to emphasize the amity between the US and South Korea, but at the same time, they're supporting the daughter of the authoritarian military dictator in the 60s and 70s. I, I mean, you you responded, well, I'm a journalist, but, but I, I mean, personally very curious how you felt about when you encounter those people. Well, you, you know, what I thought was, I, I just held it back because, um, you know, the, the students, if you look, if you look at the, the, that clip um, in the square, it's mostly older Koreans who were protesting against the impeachment of Park Gwen Hae. And, you know, they come from a generation that fought in the Korean War. And, and that was to fight with the Americans, the communists that were coming to take over the country. So you can understand their, their feeling. What I didn't agree with personally was that the students back in 1987 were communists and the people who were asking for Park Gwen Hayes impeachment um, were not socialists and communists either. They, want, they wanted the courts to decide on the impeachment, and they did. You know, Park, Park Gwen Hay was, is, I think she's still in jail, or she just got released, I think. Um, but, you know, she embezzled $65 million or something. So, so it really had nothing to do with socialism or communism or, or, or anything else. So, but I understand their point. Um, because they fought in the Korean War and they fought against communists, and they think any movement in that direction is is a communist movement. So I I, I understand I understood his point of view. But, um, it's it certainly was the furthest from the truth. There were there certainly in 1987 in the 1980s there there were certainly communist elements in the society. Um, but they weren't, it, it certainly wasn't the focus of what those students and most of the demonstrators were, were about. They wanted the dictators gone and they wanted, um, they wanted free and fair elections. And Korea has been a very successful democracy um, since 1987. You know, they've had, they've had their political problems and, and several of the presidents have gone to jail. Um, but what we noticed in the society now is, is, is how far advanced they have gone because of the freedoms that they have. Um, and it's an, it's an amazing uh, culture. And, and they're, they're reaping the benefits of, of that, those 30 years now, whereas the world is really embracing Korean pop culture. It's really quite fascinating to see. And and also the exhibition, uh, wonders and witness uh, the Korean photography contemporary photography exhibition, uh, starts uh, uh, with 1990s. So like, but it also uh, with an acknowledgement of like 1988 Summer Olympic Games uh, held in Seoul, and then toward the the late 1980s and the early 1990s, the idea of like almost ideology of a globalism and globalization and the rapid development throughout the country and urbanization and also like, but at the same time, all the uh, uh, thorny issues and problems still remain with patriarchy and also like uh, like the this kind of like fantasized anxiety over like communism or socialism and also rat complex still, um, vivid uh especially among the generation just noted as well so like it's kind of like um elusive uh uh imaginary of enemy 
because they need enemy to 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 justify their uh, status and uh, in Korean society. I think uh, we could open the floor to questions. So I, yeah. So I visited uh, South Korea for the first time a year ago in October. Um, and on the issue of communism, and I guess this also relates to generational gaps, it was interesting to me, I would talk to people about uh, Kim Jong-un and the missiles and his escalation of militarization of North Korea and all that. And it, it was striking to me that many people, particularly young people, did not seem concerned. Um, you know, they would say things like, yeah, he's always doing that, they're always doing that. We're used to it, we don't pay much attention to it. Um, I think the older generation with whom I talked to didn't seem that blasé about it, but um, I wonder if there is a change now when it seems, I mean, just recently that North Korea is declaring the South their eternal enemy and all that. It, it, do you think that attitude is changing? And why is it, I mean, there's a concern about communism, but we're not too concerned about what they're doing up there. I, it was hard for me to kind of figure out not quite sure about um it's a generational <laughs> gap or a generational issue because i'm pretty much concerned about the situation but at the same time like um like the always the the north korean uh launch missiles uh, it always immediately politicized by the government and also the japanese government also the chinese government the u.s government uh like, but at the same time, I never thought, uh, and still do not think North Korea is communist. Like they are just totalitarian regime. So it was just dubbed as common, was born as communist state, but not anymore communist, I, neither socialist. So, but at the same time, it is true that we are used to this tension, but at the same time, uh, we, uh, well, I can I cannot say I'm the representative of Korean people, South Korean people, but at the same time, like uh, we are fully aware of geopolitics, like uh, how the the U.S. or China or Russia like are willingly ready to use this moment or this momentum to reinstate uh, sort of like the new Cold War, like. Uh, so we are fully aware of this situation. That's the most concerned, uh, concerning uh, point for many Korean people, like like Japanese government and the U.S. government, Russian government. They basically has zero interest in unification of both uh, Koreas, but they all, rather they might welcome this tension, maintain this tension forever for for their own uh, for their own purpose and use. Yeah. Oh, for the recording. Yeah, I just have a really quick question. I had no idea. It seemed like there were a lot of students who were killed or a lot of people killed during that democracy movement. I had no sense of that. Do, do you know how many there were? Because I was thinking, I always think of this one young man because I saw the film, other film before. And I was just thinking as we were watching it, my God, this one young man and the 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 outpouring of, of grief around him. And I was thinking of the thousands killed in Gaza. Um, there's no time you know, for any kind of, of, of grieving or, or, you know, talk about, but how many, how many young people were killed during that movement? Well, I, I'm always hesitant to, to, to quantify uh, the violence. So many people, but at the same time, even one person just became the victim of state violence still 
matters. I mean, still has strong impact on Korean society. But at the same time, not just the, the college students, but a lot of civilians, like throughout 70s and 80s. So like uh, the Korean government uh, launches some kind of like uh, uh, initiative for like the reconciliation and also uh, truth uh, like uh, for uh, basically uh, doing a, a research on like who were the victims and how many people were the victims and and how they were traumatized losing their family members and also sometimes like uh, physically uh, uh, challenged or were disabled after joining all these kind of street protests and the movement as well. So, yeah. Hey. <clears throat> oh my gosh. Hi, it's an honor to actually meet you both. Um, your photo actually is one of the reasons I'm applying to grad schools very soon. So um, I actually had the crazy honor of learning about all of these events last semester in South Korea at Hanyang University while living in Shincheon on Yonsei-do Terenggye, so very close to Yonsei University where all of this took place. Um, I did have a question for kind of both of you. Uh, Korea has an incredibly high voting population and a majority of people that were involved in these uprisings are still living and voting and participating in democracy actively currently. So I'm wondering if you feel that the fact that a lot of these students are still participating in the democracy and since it was so well documented, these uprisings, that that contributes a lot to Korea's passion for its democracy and its maintenance of peaceful protesting and its democracy as a whole. Thank you for the question. Well, um, first of all, I always feel like um, Korean people are always ready to be on the street whenever we have an issue. We could change because we're going to be on the street regardless of weather. So that that's what we've been witnessing since the 70s and 80s all the way in 2017. And and I do see, I still see a lot of people um, responding to the, the government's policy, like, like we are ready to be on the street if you do something wrong. We are always ready to, to impeach the president. So you are hired temporarily by the people, by us. So, and and at the same time, um, because some of you ask about the generational gap, like like Gen Z or <laughs> Generation M, MZ, um, there's always like not not only for the the Korean uh, history, but I think that this is kind of global phenomenon as well. Like there are always revisionist and denialist. So like even the people you met on the street when you noted about 1987 student demonstration, thanks to those uh, street protests, you guys are able to protest on the street uh, here, but they they responded, well, they the, that one was also communist protest as well. So, but at the same time, there are still, even from the very same generation of Yi Han -yar, and these college students, uh, other very uh, conservative politicians from the from the exactly same generation, like uh, at the time, not all of the college students were were on street. I mean, substantial number of students were in the library to be success to be successful student or to get um, to get uh, like law degree or to to get a good job after graduation. So then like the these people also played a very crucial role in the Korea in the history of Korea. So there there are always pe people from that very same generation always denied uh that that the impact or the the role of these uh college students protest and civilian protests and also like uh accusing them of like like anti-state or pro-north 
or pro-communist. So it still has a very vivid impact uh, whenever we have elections for like politicians and for presidents. So it's, it's, it's mixed and divided, but at the same time, I think that's the, the core of a democracy too. So we always have like conflicting issues, but we still on our own street and we still have conversations and argue again and again. Yeah, and I think the the people in this in this film that you saw, you know, they're think of them as being thirty years younger, and many of them were out protesting back in nineteen eighty seven, and then when we went up to the candlelight vigil, you know, a lot of those were um, um, middle aged, middle class families with their children that were out protesting, and those children's parents were protesting back in back in the 80s. Also, this focuses on Yonsei University, but at the time, these demonstrations were going on at every major university in, the, in, in Seoul, at um, Seoul National University, at Iwa Women's University. Um, there, there, were demo, there were demonstrations everywhere uh, in, in the city at the time. Um, hello. Um, I've got a, about three questions still working them through in my head, but um, first one to uh, Mr. Newton. Um, when you were over there or when you've been back to Korea, have you spoken or read any articles interesting about uh, Korean military, police, government officials who were part of the regime at that time and how do they feel about it? its fall or anything? Mm -hmm. No, not not recently have I have I read anything. Um, uh, you know, Chun Doo Wan was in jail and he was released and he was released. Um, um, I think No Tae was in jail and he was released. Um, and Park Gwen Hae was, you know, she was impeached and she was in jail. <laughs> yeah, and she's now been re been released. Um, no, when I've gone back in the in the last few years, um, the f the focus has been on the current society and how how advanced and how amazing what's going on there socially. I, I found. So, um, for both of y'all or anybody else in the panel, the two Koreas and the two Chinas are basically like the last remnants of the Cold War. Um, do you see like anything? that will stop escalation from all sides from the in the Koreas or in the Strait without it having to get kinetic? Well, it's a difficult question. And I don't, don't, I can't predict how the two Koreas or even Taiwan and China and their relationship would turn. Uh, uh, but 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 at the same time, I want to also make a comment about uh, on your first question mm -hmm. as well. Uh, Chon Duan passed away mm -hmm. without any apology to yes. any of these family members, and he never accepted uh, what he did was uh, violence and state violence. So, like uh, we, I could tell, like for especially Ian Yong's mother, how she felt uh, when. Chan Duan passed away without any apology. Yeah, and Mrs. Bay Chen, um, Yi Han Yul's mother, she passed away last year, actually. And um, Rote Wu passed away about two years ago, I believe. Uh, and he was given ago. a state funeral, and that was a big thing. It wasn't true proper because they tried to hide it under COVID. But do you guys think that they shouldn't have done that like they did with Chun Du Huan? Just but at the, uh, well, like I, I noted earlier, uh, recently uh, a film, uh, Spring of Soul, was released about uh, the coup d'etat uh, by Chan Duhan. And then after the, the film's release, uh, there was some kind of like TV documentary, like how these people who joined Chan Duhan's coup d'etat at the time are living now. 
So they are basically very well, <laughs> very affluent, mm -hmm. and, and and mostly remain invisible to the public. Uh, and some the the some of the journalists try to interview them. They refuse to answer to any of the uh, offer and uh, contact. But at the same time, uh, because I'm a photo historian. Uh, in my class, we also discuss a lot about photojournalism and its role. But uh, but at the same time, uh, in many many types of uh, state violence and the photographs about those state violence or historical tragedies, there are numerous photographs of victims, and in many cases, perpetrators remain invisible. So. The, the focus was always on the face of the victim rather than the face of a perpetrator, the inflictor of violence. So may, that is the moment like we and the, my class, I mean, my students try to address like how to uh, visualize the perpetrator in photographs or in, in, in other uh, media as well. So I, I mean, again, like to, to Kim, like curious, like how, when you witness these, all these uh, tragic moments, so whether you also thought about like the perpetrators or the inflictors instead of the victims. That, that's a really, that's a really great question. Uh, I think when you're on the ground in those situations, it's it's the victims that is your main focus, and um, and it's interesting. You're right. You know there were there were countless number of people killed in this democracy movement over decades, and. Park Chung Chul and Yi Han Yul were two that died that year. There were more that died that year, but why they became the national martyr, um, I think just all the elements of what was going on at the time came together. Um, I think Yi Han Yul, uh, when, he, when he was hit with that tear gas canister, and you saw all the students being called to go to the hospital to protect them from being kidnapped by the government because there was a history there with Park Chung Chol where the government, Park Chung Chol was um, waterboarded to death. Uh, he was basically drowned uh, during interrogation in a building in downtown Seoul that we could never get near, but we knew existed. Uh, today, it's a, it's a museum. You can actually go visit it and see exactly what those rooms were like. It's, it's, it's pretty heartbreaking, really. But um, um, Park Chung Chul, the government was about to have him cremated before he had a autopsy. They didn't want him to have an autopsy. And um, the Catholic Church got wind of this. And that's when those protests came out at the church. And, um, they, and they had an autopsy and they realized he was, and they were gonna cremate him and then just scatter his ashes. Uh, somewhere, but none of that happened in the in the end. So you have to think about what was what was going on, and I think the Park Chung Chol incident, and then Yi Han Yul, they knew what happened to Park Chung Chol or was going to happen, so they went to the hospital, the students, um, to protect him. But it was a month until they announced his death. They kept him on life support. Um, for a month, I, I think they they did that to try to um, keep the violence down in the city. If he had died that day, what would have happened? But but in the end, it was a major catalyst 
um, to the ending of the Chenduan government. And also, ironically, the very person who drowned uh, Park Chung Chow many, many decades later. I mean, he was uh, basically, it was revealed who he was. And then um, after he um, quit his position at those like Korean CIA, then he became a minister. So, so it was also really shocking news uh, for the Korean public as well. So, so he said like he was um, like um, he made an apology to the God. <laughs> okay, mm. I have a question for Professor Kim Newton. In the documentary, you said that you were afraid that the government had tapped the phone and you had to be careful about what you said to the to your publishers or whoever you worked for. How did this affect your ability to do your job as a photojournalist? Yeah, I think um, all the reporters talked about this. We, you know, we were all pretty much together on this. Um, a lot of us were staying in hotels. I had friends who had an apartment, um, and we pretty much we we were pretty sure that his phone was tapped. Um, you you just adjust your conversation with with editors. Um, we would often be called into this national police unit to be questioned. Um, none of us were ever arrested or really detained for anything. Um, but it was it was something that was always on our that was always on our minds, um, and. All the reporters always discussed it, and I think our editors in New York were aware of that. So you know, we we really had nothing to be. We were there to cover what we were seeing, and and um, um, but you never know when a government's going to turn on you, and um, you know what we were showing was not flattering to the government at all. And uh, I think we were very fortunate at the time uh, to be able to be in such a huge mass of journalists. And again, I think the reason was the Olympics were coming and they had to allow us to be there. Um, that That's just one of the, the rules of um, signing on to the Olympics is that you open your doors to the world's media. Um, China found ways to sh shut that coverage down when they had the Olympics, but most countries are, are open to it, and and surprisingly, Korea was too. So, are there any more questions? So you're welcome to come down and ask and talk to them in person. We thank you so much for being here tonight for the wonderful conversation. And Dr. D. Hey Kim mentioned the exhibition. I just wanted to remind you that the catalogs, if you want to discover a little bit more about um, South Korean photographers, contemporary co photographers and artists, it's on sale from this. And again, thank you so much for being here and have a great night.